But also, you know, aspects of my biography that I've long forgotten, I need to be reminded of, and Walter's always kind enough to do that. Um, so I, uh, I, I come here in a slightly different um, manner than ordinarily. Um, I ordinarily speak to the topics of my research. Um, actually, uh, for anybody who's interested in that sort of thing, on November 10th with the, uh, the political science department uh, colloquium, um, of, of, I think probably in this room, um, on that Monday at uh, 1230, I'll be talking about uh, the, the breakup of Yugoslavia and the impact of that event on uh, future trajectories in, in uh, international law. Um, but I wanted to speak with you all today about something uh, quite different, something having to do really with our role in the university, uh, with the kinds of issues that we face day to day uh, as teachers and in participation uh, in, in the running of the institution. Uh, and uh, to uh, look at this more in the, uh, in, in the, the, the mode of a, a public intellectual uh, rather than simply that of a scholar. Uh, so uh, although there'll be some very addition here that isn't really uh, the focus of it all, and you, you have this uh, handout here, uh, which uh, particularly is significant in that I might not be able to elaborate uh, all of these points about viewpoint neutrality and public truth to uh, terms that I use in the title of the talk, and this uh, gives you some background uh, into the nature of those things, which we'll talk a little bit about, uh, but I don't want to get uh, too uh, deep into some of these kinds of uh, theoretical problems um, at the expense of talking about some of the concrete issues uh, that, that face us in terms of matters uh, concerning this, this general topic of civility. Uh, and uh, I, I come here not with a set of pat answers about civility questions. In fact, just the opposite of that. I, I come out of a sense of profound irritation about the pat answers that I always hear about civility questions. And so I want to open certain kinds of topics up for conversation uh, and to suggest that there are different ways of looking at this question uh, than the, the ways that what we have been uh, hearing about so frequently. Uh, and so um, let me first say that I've been threatening for ages to give a talk uh, that I wanted to entitle Why I'm Against Tolerance, Diversity, and Sensitivity. Um, and I, I thought about that as a title. I thought maybe that might overshoot the target of capturing <laughs> uh, interest in the topic. But I, but I really mean it. And I, I really mean it for, for a couple of reasons. Um, one of which is that, that those words um, are chosen for a kind of content or substance neutrality, um, uh, that uh, they appeal to neutral principles, abstracting from substantive issues. Uh, and uh, for that very reason, they can be turned around. When I was at Swarthmore, uh, my roommate and I always used to make all these snarky remarks about tolerance and diversity. And the reason was that they were typically, those concepts were typically invoked uh, on behalf of the frat boys um, against the feminists uh, in the, the context of dealing with issues that arose over uh, sexual harassment and other kinds of matters on campus. If you have these words that are so totally vacuous uh, in terms of their content, uh, they can be turned around to whatever purpose uh, people might see fit. Uh, the other problem with those terms uh, is that they mistake uh, personal for political virtues. And that is to say that um, as a personal matter, of course, one should be tolerant, one should be appreciative of diversity, one should be sensitive. Uh, I'd like to think that I embody those virtues. I think most people who know me sort of think that I have those virtues. Um, but the, the, the problem is that uh, these are, are virtues, particularly in the context where you are dealing only with the duties that you have toward those upon whom you are acting. Um, but when you step into a political realm more broadly understood, you have not only duties to the people upon whom you're acting, you're also, you also have duties uh, to people on behalf of whom you undertake to act. Uh, and there are frequently tensions between those duties. Uh, and those tensions are uh, directly pertinent to this question. Um, if your interlocutor, for example, uh, has victims, uh, actual or potential, uh, then treating that interlocutor with civility uh, has certain kinds of consequences that go uh, beyond uh, the, the kind of, uh, of matters that we think of in, in general terms of personal virtue. 
And we've been hearing a lot about civility lately, uh, particularly from leaders of universities. Um, Chancellor Nicholas Dirks of uh, my PhD alma mater at the University of California at Berkeley decided, rather oddly I thought, uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the free speech movement uh, with an email that he sent around uh, to the campus um, saying this, as we honor this turning point in our history, it is important that we recognize the broader social context required in order uh, for free speech to thrive. Uh, specifically, uh, we can only exercise our right to free speech insofar as we feel safe and respected in doing so, and this in turn requires that people treat each other with civility. Uh, simply put, courteousness and respect in words and deeds are basic preconditions to any meaningful exchange of ideas. Uh, I'm not sure that Mario Savio and the like uh, would have agreed back in 1964. Um, but uh, but that, uh, that comes from uh, the chancellor of the leading public university in the country. At least that's what I call it. Um, more darkly, the chancellor of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, Phyllis Wise, uh, spoke similarly, but in a with much more direct application. Uh, and you may be familiar with the case of Stephen Salada, um, uh, who was hired and then uh, rather remarkably unhired uh, in midstream by the University of Illinois uh, after I, I guess he had already quit his old job and was expecting to be stepping into a new uh, tenured position uh, and suddenly found uh, himself ousted and he did on the basis uh, of some tweets that he gave. I, I never understand why people want to communicate in tweets. Anyway, uh, but uh, they, these, these tweets gave rise to a kind of controversy uh, that led uh, the chancellor and, and others at the University of Illinois to uh, take the decision to uh, uh, cancel the latest hiring. Uh, and the idea was, as she put it, the, the, uh, the uncivil tenor of his comments and uh, the concerns expressed by pro-Israeli uh, students uh, who said they would feel intimidated uh, by the professor uh, gave rise to this. Uh, she said, and I quote, uh, what we cannot and will not tolerate at the University of Illinois are personal and disrespectful words or actions that demean and abuse either viewpoints themselves or those who express them. This I find quite troubling uh, and really predicated on a kind of misunderstanding that the invocation of the concept of civility engenders. Um, and so what I want to say about civility uh, is that while it's a presumptive virtue, it's only a presumptive virtue. Uh, and uh, that the most fundamental determinants of how to teach to how, to how to treat others in what is fundamentally a political context, uh, broadly understood, um, uh, are orthogonal to questions of civility. Uh, that, uh, that criticisms of incivility uh, miss the point about expression that's truly unacceptable uh, and, uh, on the other hand, fail to appreciate <coughs> justifications uh, for uh, uncivil expression. Uh, they miss the point because most of the time discussion of civility relates to issues having to do with hate speech. Um, and I actually want to stand up for the category of hate speech, but hate speech is a substantive category. It's not about uh, how nice we are to one another and the, 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 our manner of presentation. Um, it has to do uh, with the content, uh, the viewpoint expressed uh, in the expression. Uh, hate speech is not wrong because it's offensive. It's offensive because it's wrong. Uh, and it's wrong uh, primarily because what it does systematically is to normalize subordination, marginalization, and exclusion of vulnerable groups in the society. Um, and that is very different uh, from uh, the question of incivility. On the other hand, um, there are uh, moments uh, for uncivil expression, particularly sometimes against the purveyors of uh, speech that substantively qualifies as hate speech. Uh, and uh, the emphasis on civility fails to acknowledge this by failing to acknowledge what I would characterize uh, as the circumstance of moral emergency 
Uh, that is to say, when, when we speak uh, in jurisprudential terms about states of emergency or states of exception, uh, we're talking about conditions in which ordinary rules of conduct are suspended um, in the service of preserving some deeper value that is under attack. Uh, and I think the, the basic justification that people would give for a kind of discourse uh, that doesn't meet the standards of civility uh, is precisely that uh, it is responsive to a certain kind of threat to more fundamental values uh, and uh, that uh, there, there is a, a real fundamental problem uh, where these fundamental values are threatened uh, if people are just going to treat those threats uh, as yet another disagreement, yet another uh, instance of business as usual. Um, if the equal status of other members of our community is being challenged, um, then uh, you know, it, is, it is not necessarily appropriate uh, to, to treat that challenge uh, with respect and as yet another uh, instance uh, of, uh, of, of sort of garden variety disagreement. Uh, it's something that threatens fundamental values and needs to be answered in a different way. Um, kind of tangential to this, but I want to sort of hold the point uh, somewhere for the conversation. Uh, we often hear uh, discussions about civil disobedience, uh, and I want to sort of uh, raise a warning uh, right away that uh, part of the problem in the way that people discuss civil disobedience uh, rather loosely uh, is to assume that uh, there is an identity between principled disobedience and civil disobedience. Uh, there are many forms of principal disobedience. Uh, one of them is civil disobedience, uh, but there are, uh, are others. Uh, and uh, they are, uh, you know, they have their justifications, uh, maybe right or maybe wrong in the final analysis, um, but uh, they have to be distinguished. And what is properly called civil disobedience has a very specific kind of meaning, um, I think best articulated by Martin Luther King in a letter from Birmingham Jail. Um, uh, which is a very particular kind of uh, understanding of, of how one ought uh, to express uh, dissent in a, in a certain context, uh, but it's, uh, it's not, it should not be taken uh, as the, uh, the, the ultimate standard of, of what is uh, appropriate uh, as a means of principled disobedience. There are many uh, different contexts and many different forms of uh, disobedience. Um, a few preliminary points before I launch into the business about uh, viewpoint neutrality. Um, first of all, uh, as I say, I've, I'm ordinarily thought of as a practitioner of civility. Um, I sometimes think of that as a character flaw. Uh, and, and, and I mean that quite seriously. I, I feel as though uh, that characteristic that I have, although it has its uses, uh, requires supplementation uh, by uh, others around me who can sort of fill the gap uh, when needed. Uh, there's an ethical division of labor, perhaps a need for a good cop, bad cop routine. Uh, so the, the mere fact that I tend towards civility in, in my own discourse uh, is, is not to the exclusion of uh, the need uh, for someone else to do, some, uh, do something different. Um, the, uh, the, the, the real problem of your arguing for civility uh, is uh, that you know, just as there's no less persuasive uh, uh, sort of advocate for peace than a pacifist, uh, so too someone who has this sort of absolute view about civility um, is in the weakest possible position uh, to make the argument to people who are skeptical of it. Uh, because with respect to a pacifist, yeah, you're for peace this time, you were for peace every time. We, all, we know you're always for peace. Even if you're giving another kind of argument that's, that's independent of your pacifism, we know that the reason why you accept that argument is because you're a pacifist and, and your, your rationale is really being driven by the outcome of that argument. Uh, and so uh, why should we take seriously uh, what you have to say in favor of civility? So most of the time I really want to argue for civility, but it has to be, in order to be persuasive, it has to be in consideration of what the limits of civility are. Uh, another problem with the discourse of civility uh, is uh, similar to uh, the, the problem that there's nothing more divisive than a call for unity. Uh, that uh, when people uh, demand unity, particularly in times of crisis, uh, what they're really trying to do is to delegitimate dissent. Uh, 
Uh, and, uh, and we saw that a lot, actually, after 9-11. I, I recall that our, our good friend Bill O'Reilly, who of course can't get any points for civility, um, uh, you know, did uh, say that, that, that those of us who disagreed with the policies uh, you know, had the, uh, the, the patriotic duty to just shut up. Um, and, uh, and so, too, though, uh, the, 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 there's a sort of condescension and exclusion that comes from these invocations of civility. It's the condescension that actually bothers me the most when I hear some of these uh, assertions uh, being made in the direction of people who have uh, protested in an uncivil manner. Uh, you know, you, you, you know, like your children, you need to be taught a thing or two uh, about how to conduct yourself appropriately. Uh, and that, I think, is a particularly insidious way of excluding uh, important messages in the society. <coughs> Um, finally, there is this problem of how to define civility, uh, and uh, it's very difficult to define civility. Uh, there is no authoritative uh, definition of it. I've heard, heard people speak to this question, uh, sometimes rather uh, irritatingly, uh, invoking uh, the, the, the sorts of conduct uh, that would be wrongful for reasons entirely independent of the question of civility. So slander is uncivil. A character assassination is uncivil, um, but that, that's uncivil for reasons, that, that the fact that it's uncivil is the reason why it's wrong. Uh, that it's, it's wrong for, uh, for because it's a lie, it's wrong because you know, you're trying to uh, uh, destroy uh, individuals in particular ways. Uh, but it, uh, the, 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 the question of civility is really quite an independent one of that. So you know, what is it we're actually talking about when we're talking about civility? And the, the best way that I can find to understand it is to say uh, that uh, civility is uh, a, a kind of respect that one confers on one's interlocutor, not merely as a human being, but as a legitimate uh, participant in a particular conversation. And if, indeed, civility is con conferring this sort of legitimacy on your interlocutor, uh, you have to come to the possibility that there might be good justifications to either withhold or repudiate uh, such an expression of legitimacy. And, um, you know, you can think of many different scenarios where this would not only be tolerable, it would be, be appropriate, indeed, perhaps obligatory. Uh, we, uh, we don't actually treat the Holocaust denier on a college campus uh, as someone who ought to be considered part of the conversation. Uh, indeed, can, treating that person as part of the conversation uh, is itself morally wrongful uh, because what Holocaust denial suggests is a massive Jewish conspiracy to fabricate an atrocity. Um, and so the, uh, the, this isn't just in the realm of garden variety disagreement. Uh, this is a kind of expression uh, that is a fundamental attack uh, on a part of the community and we don't uh, think that this is uh, appropriate uh, as, a, as a matter of uh, control of literacy. Um, give an anecdote from here uh, to, to sort of bring it right home. Um, a few years ago, the Wayne Law Review, my, my law colleagues are in the, uh, the audience, they might remember, it's, the Wayne Law Review had a national security symposium uh, and invited to speak uh, rather over my objection. Um, at this National Security Symposium uh, were two individuals uh, of some note. Um, one uh, was Andrew McCarthy, uh, no, not the actor Andrew McCarthy, mm -hmm. um, uh, but Andrew McCarthy, the National Review commentator. Um, uh, all, all I need to say about Andrew McCarthy is that he is the author of the book called The Grand Jihad, How Islam and the Left Sabotage America. I don't think I need to say a lot more about Andrew McCarthy than that. Um, the other person uh, was John Rizzo, who was uh, the general counsel to the CIA during the time of the torture memos and uh, the decision to engage in practices such as waterboarding uh, against people who had uh, uh, been fallen into the hands of the United States government in the course of the so-called global war on terrorism. Um, these exemplify two different justifications for the withdrawal or repudiation of civility. Um, McCarthy, because of the viewpoint uh, expressed, 
Um, and Rizzo, not because of the viewpoint expressed, actually I was perfectly fine with what he had to say at the conference, uh, it was the fact that he was there. Uh, it was the fact that he was treated respectfully as an expert on questions of national security when in fact he was an unpunished wrongdoer. Uh, when at minimum um, he is properly chargeable with breach of breaches of the canons of ethics um, and quite arguably um, responsible for criminal acts without any doubt responsible for violations of uh, international human rights obligations of the United States. And so I found myself in the position of having to figure out how to interact uh, at, in the course of the conference with McCarthy and with Rizzo. And uh, the reason why he was invited was because there's a particular dignit dignitary important to the law school who saw to it that they would be invited. Um, and I had to think long and hard about this, and I decided that there's a duty of civility on the one hand, which I didn't think I had, but a duty of decorum on the other hand, which is very different, uh, that I did have. That I, I had an obligation not to embarrass my institution uh, by behaving in an undecorous manner in that circumstance. Uh, on the other hand, I was so wishing that my students uh, would come and make a mess of the whole thing. Uh, and I also didn't want my fingerprints on that, so I didn't suggest that anybody would do that. Um, but I was deeply disappointed uh, that they were able to get away without um, some manifest effort to withdraw uh, the honor bestowed upon them by having them sit on these panels uh, to discuss in a serious way as experts uh, of matters having to do with the national security of the United States. Um, and so that gives you some sense of, of where the issues are. And uh, you know, the, 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 the key point here isn't whether it would have been right or wrong to be uncivil to them. The, the, the key point is that these are, are serious arguments in play. Uh, and you can use your favorite example as you see fit uh, to, to sort of fit into the, uh, the principles at stake. Uh, but I think it's important to, uh, to understand uh, that there are strong arguments to be made, uh, uh, and particularly in contexts uh, where some sort of honor is being bestowed on a person, where the honor uh, perhaps given from above might be withdrawn from below uh, by those who uh, object to the conferral of that honor uh, uh, explicitly or implicitly. Um, the, um, the way that we talk about civility, I think, is very heavily influenced uh, by the way that First Amendment jurisprudence has developed. And so your handout uh, elaborates that in some detail. Uh, the critical uh, principle of First Amendment law uh, at stake here is viewpoint neutrality. And everybody knows that the First Amendment uh, only applies to governmental regulation of speech. But there is a, a, a sense in the culture uh, that we have something called the spirit of the First Amendment. I'm not quite sure what that means, uh, but there is supposedly a spirit of the First Amendment uh, that should inform the way in which we deal with uh, civility uh, issues. And uh, this idea of viewpoint neutrality, of course, is the idea that there, there is no such thing from a First Amendment standpoint as a, a false idea. Uh, that is a, an oft-repeated quotation from Supreme Court cases. Um, and uh, it has some very peculiar uh, uh, outcomes. And uh, I've given you some in the, in the sheet discussion of uh, one of the more peculiar cases, RAB versus St. Paul, that had to do with cross burning, but particularly had to do with the, this ordinance in the city of St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, which had sought to regulate speech um, particularly uh, in, uh, in regard to uh, uh, race, color, creed, religion, uh, and gender, uh, where the speech fell beneath the threshold of general First Amendment protection. That is to say that certain forms of speech, either incitement or provocation uh, to imminent lawless action, uh, is regulable under the First Amendment. Um, the remarkable thing about R.A.V. versus St. Paul is that it was held that while you could regulate the, that sort of speech generally, you couldn't choose sides uh, in regulating that speech. You couldn't have an ordinance that was directed against uh, speech that uh, was provocative or insightful uh, on the basis 
of uh, uh, some uh, kind of uh, uh, agenda uh, of, uh, of sort of sub marginalization, subordination, or exclusion of people on the ground of race, uh, color, creed, religion, or gender. Um, that would uh, that would be unfair in some sense. Uh, you would be uh, sort of tipping the balance in favor of one ideological faction uh, over another. People who were fighting for equality uh, on these grounds would, would be perfectly licensed uh, to use fighting words uh, in their, uh, their demonstrations, uh, whereas the other side would be at a disadvantage. Um, that struck many of us as a strange holding, but it actually follows directly from this viewpoint neutrality idea. Um, it's important to note, by the way, that uh, viewpoint neutrality is not inherent in the idea of freedom of expression in general. Um, it does not date from 1791. It's not handed down to us by the framers of the Constitution. In fact, it was really quite foreign to our constitutional jurisprudence until about the 1960s. Um, and it is utterly foreign uh, to uh, such constitutional jurisprudence in the liberal democratic uh, states uh, of uh, most of the liberal democratic states of, of Europe and, and, and other kind of comparable uh, legal systems. Um, it, it is uh, a really a, a kind of uh, uh, sort of codification of John Stuart Mill's understanding of freedom of expression and on liberty. Uh, and it, it really is a not only a recent but rather parochial uh, kind of interpretation of what freedom of expression is about is directly contradicted by the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, the United States is a party to that treaty but subject to a reservation, uh, subject to many reservations actually, but subject particularly to a reservation in respect of the hate speech provision of the ICCPR because the ICCPR, uh, while on the one hand protecting freedom of expression, also uh, directs states to suppress expression that falls within the category of hate speech. Uh, and so these are uh, different interpretations of what freedom of expression might mean uh, and uh, the international and comparative uh, approaches to this, uh, as well as the historical approach in the United States, differ from the present day approach. Um, that's not to say that the present day approach is wrong. Um, it is, however, uh, to say that it needs to be defended more elaborately uh, than it ordinarily is. Uh, and I think that many of the uh, efforts to defend it uh, fall short. The ones that I think are most persuasive are ones that specifically have application to governmental regulation that don't carry over uh, to questions about civility in general. Uh, and so um, the, uh, the, the, the ones that I think fall short, and you, you can probably list a lot of them, um, but uh, the, the, the one that people I think are most likely to give is the, the one that uh, I want to object to the most, which is the notion that somehow um, it, it, it violates a principle of equality. You get to say what you want to say, but the other person uh, shouldn't be able to say something that you don't like. It goes along uh, with uh, this, uh, this rhetoric that we uh, see uh, coming from Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, in, uh, that I've reproduced for you here, that uh, you know, uh, fr freedom for the thought that we hate uh, is, uh, is indispensable to the idea uh, of freedom of expression. Um, but uh, the objection to hate speech is not an assertion that we get to say what other people uh, say and, and, and you know, we don't accept such regulation ourselves. It's not a matter of subjective preference uh, because principles cannot be reduced to the preferences of those who hold them. Uh, and, and actually questions about the scope of free speech are themselves uh, principles like all others. Um, and, uh, and the substantive principles are, are, are not to be disparaged uh, any more than the uh, procedural principles because in fact ultimately the procedural principles rest on substantive grounds. Uh, we embrace certain procedural solutions precisely because we uh, believe that they will have uh, certain subsequent substantive outcomes uh, for our society. Uh, and so there's no inconsistency in saying that I should be able to espouse social democracy, but he shouldn't be able to espouse Nazism. Um, it, it matters whether it's social democracy or Nazism. Uh, and, uh, and so that, I think, uh, doesn't work uh, as, a, uh, as a response. Uh, but there are other, I think, more um, uh, sort of 
deeper intellectual justifications that are given uh, for freedom of expression. The most popular uh, ones come from John Stuart Mill, uh, and they have to do with kind of utilitarian value uh, of, uh, of freedom of expression and the quest for truth, and the idea that a free marketplace of ideas uh, is a place in which uh, truth is more likely to win out. Uh, and indeed, uh, perhaps the most powerful argument uh, in, in that realm is the notion uh, that uh, even uh, where the dissentients are wrong, uh, uh, you know, we should still need to have them uh, because they uh, allow us to hone our arguments uh, better about what's right. Uh, that uh, that we, we would have to invent uh, dissenters if they weren't there uh, just to, uh, to make us better at, at understanding the grounds of our own position uh, and being able to articulate it persuasively. Um, that's an interesting argument. Um, but I don't think it actually applies very well to the, the kinds of, of speech uh, that we're talking about in the realm of hate speech. Uh, and I think uh, that it, it fails um, on somewhat the ground that Wilmore Kendall, my favorite critic uh, of, uh, of Mill, uh, points out, and that is that Mill, uh, uh, as uh, Kendall puts it, takes pains to reduce the question should some types of expression be prohibited in civil society because the ideas uh, are, uh, 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 that, that they express are intellectually incorrect. Um, if the, uh, if the, 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 the idea that, uh, uh, that, that, that everything is reducible to that rather than the, the, the question we should be asking, according to Kendall, is should some types of, of expression be prohibited in civil society because the ideas expressed are wicked? Um, and, uh, and as Kendall puts it, uh, uh, citing Socrates, uh, uh, he who teaches my neighbor evil does me hurt. Um, the, uh, the Mill was not confronted with the kinds of questions uh, that we face more recently about uh, the kinds of speech that, uh, that deny the status uh, of particularly vulnerable minorities in the, in the population. Um, and he was mostly, of course, uh, looking to bolster those who were resisting uh, the forces of the status quo. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the kind of issue that we face here um, is a problem not just because the, the, uh, because what, what I would characterize as hate speech isn't any plausible contribution to the quest for truth, but also because the quest for truth, as Kendall points out, isn't an end in itself either. Uh, that the quest for truth, in fact, uh, arises within a certain context. Um, and uh, for us, I think it is uh, most properly understood as a context uh, of uh, the, uh, the, the project of equal concern and respect uh, in the society. Uh, and, uh, and I take that language specifically from Ronald Dworkin, uh, that, uh, that what, what really marks a democracy uh, is the notion that uh, people have a certain kind of equal status in the society uh, and that the public policies of that society manifest a set of equal concern uh, for all members of that society. Now, Dworkin himself, oddly enough, uh, took a different position about freedom of expression. Uh, and it's one that's always really puzzled me. And it's a different view from the million view. He, he doesn't try to take the position that the free marketplace of ideas will uh, solve all problems or that, uh, uh, that, that somehow it, it is uh, on utilitarian grounds good to allow uh, this sort of expression. Uh, rather, he sees it as a matter of the dignity of the individual uh, on the ground that if you're going to expect people to accept collective decisions in the society, uh, that they have to be respected as having a right to equal participation and particularly equal capacity to affect what he calls the moral environment in the society. Uh, that's an interesting thesis, but one that I find all the more puzzling coming from him uh, than from almost anyone else because uh, Ronald Dworkin uh, also believes uh, that uh, judicial review of legislation should be used uh, quite vigorously to thwart any effort by legislative majorities to undermine equal concern and respect. Uh, and so he wants to let people have their best shot at affecting the moral environment, and then he wants to shut them down if they're going to win uh, and thwart their, uh, the, the, the fruits of their victory. Um, so I don't really understand how he can consistently hold those two positions. Uh, in any event, the, uh, the, the characterization of uh, affecting the moral environment, I think, is crucial. 
Because the problem with hate speech isn't that it's going to get a legislative majority. It's not that we're going to elect Hitler president. Um, it's that, uh, the, that if you incubate these kinds of ideas, if you make it seem normal uh, to express these ideas in particular <coughs> parts of the society, uh, that you make life more dangerous uh, for people who are subject to that expression. Uh, that they are more likely to find themselves confronted in the long term uh, with discrimination, uh, with hostility, potentially with violence. Uh, and so um, I, I think it's, it's very puzzling to say that viewpoint neutrality um, uh, should be embraced in the name of equal concern and respect, um, just as I think it is uh, uh, odd to embrace it in the name of the, the pursuit of truth. Um, I do think there is something to be said for it, though. Uh, and what's to be said for it is, uh, to, to use the language of John Rawls, uh, not that it's part of a kind of overlapping consensus of reasonable worldviews, but that it's part of a modus vivendi. Uh, that it is, it is part of, it's the best deal we can get in the society on the question of governmental regulation of speech. Uh, it may be that we can uh, generally agree in the abstract that certain sorts of views are out of bounds uh, pretty much across the legitimate political spectrum uh, in the United States. Uh, but that would be true at the level of platitude rather than at the level of application. Uh, that at the level of application it would turn out uh, that because we hold that, uh, the, the, what ostensibly are the same set of views on this question for different reasons, uh, we would set the, the, the standards differently, we would draw the line in different places, um, and, uh, and, and the, really the best way for us to be able to have a framework of accommodation constitutionally in the society is to just have this deal. We won't mess with yours, you don't mess with ours, and that means the, the easiest way is we just don't mess with anybody. Uh, and, uh, and I think that that's a, a perfectly plausible uh, constitutional solution. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm a complete fan of it or not, but I, I think it's a good argument. Uh, the other argument that I think is a good argument is what I call the untrustworthy implementers argument. Um, and, uh, and this is, is sort of more a Montesquieuian than a million uh, justification of freedom of speech. Montesquieu was uh, uh, famously concerned uh, that speech was so nebulous uh, that, that interpreting what was actually meant by speech uh, in its context is, is so difficult to pin down. Uh, that, uh, that you couldn't really trust how it was going to be, uh, uh, any, any regulation of it was going to be applied, uh, and that, uh, that punishments uh, along these lines would sort of serve nefarious interests. And the, the reality I think we face is that if we put people in charge uh, of governmental regulation uh, uh, and give them a mandate to, uh, to, to regulate hate speech, that they're going to end up doing things that we didn't have in mind. Um, so I think it's sort of sociologically the case that uh, people who are in the business of censorship are not the most sophisticated people. Uh, you, know, you sort of assume uh, that the, the kind of, uh, of deep thought that went into creating the standards will go into applying the standards, but you can't control who apply the standards, and um, I think there tends to be a pretty strong disconnect there. So I think you know, the, 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 my position isn't so much to, to question the constitutional uh, standard that we've adopted in the United States, although I think it's certainly up, up for debate, um, but it is what it is. Now, the real question is what implications does it have uh, for how we deal uh, with these various questions uh, that arise? And, and my answer to that is it doesn't have much uh, effect on that. Um, it might be the case on our particular campus uh, that we would take the same view of modus vivendi uh, broadly that we would take with respect to governmental regulation. We, we won't mess with yours, you don't mess with ours, let's not mess with anybody. Um, uh, but if there is no modus vivendi, in fact, uh, if people are being uncivil to one another, uh, then uh, you know, why, why, would, why would our side unilaterally disarm? Um, it, it's, it's, I think, an, an empirical question as to whether uh, there's, there's any hold uh, for that, uh, that kind of argument. Um, I want to get to discussion, but I, I, I do want to sort of uh, lay out a few of the circumstances in which these sorts of issues arise. Uh, and the, uh, the, the first uh, instance that is sort of on the table is the Stephen Salada 
uh, question. And it, it sort of, I think, is a, a pretty good illustration of Montesquieu's problem uh, of context. Uh, and tweeting is just about the worst thing you could possibly do. Don't, don't ever do that. <laughs> um, you know, so, so Stephen Salada is uh, you know, sort of responding to the bombardment of the Gaza Strip and the Israeli incursion into the Gaza Strip. Um, this was, from my perspective, a really awful thing. Um, 2,000 Palestinians were killed, a uh, great majority of them civilians, um, something like 500 of them children. Um, it, also, from my point of view, and I don't know, not to start a, start a discussion substantively on this question, but uh, certainly it's reasonable to conclude from my own perspective um, that this was Israel's war of choice. Uh, that, uh, that, that, this, uh, the, uh, that this was instigated deliberately uh, by the Israeli government uh, on this particular occasion. Not that there wasn't a long-term security threat, but they seized this moment uh, in order to deal with the threat and, and seized the moment to deal with it in a particular way. Um, and, uh, and, and so the, the sense of outrage uh, that is contained in these tweets uh, is something that uh, I find defensible. And um, then you have this uh, fundamental question about anti-Semitism, because many of the tweets uh, have reference to anti-Semitism. And I can hand around to you uh, the, uh, this article from the New York Times that reproduces the tweets. Uh, and uh, I, I think that in their context, they mean something different from what they might be read to, to mean uh, at first glance. Um, he, uh, he, he says in one of them, the logic of, quote, anti-Semitism, unquote, deployed by Zionists if applied in principle would make pretty much anybody not a sociopath, quote, anti-Semitic, unquote. Um, if he didn't have the quotes there, I think that would mean something different from what he intended. Um, another one is, if it's, quote, anti-Semitic, unquote, to deplore colonization, land theft, and child murder, then what choice does any person of conscience have? Um, and uh, then another one, uh, Zionists, colon, transforming, quote, anti-Semitism, unquote, uh, from something horrible into something honorable since 1948. Um, that's not how I would have phrased it. But, uh, but, I, but there is something that he's saying there that actually, um, and, and I think in the broader context of, of his expression, uh, is, is, is probably his idea. Um, that um, the, 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 the use of the, the anti-Semitism trope uh, here by uh, certain uh, parts of the, the political community uh, that, that seek to uh, vigorously defend uh, the, uh, the Netanyahu government um, is really is sort of deployed as a tactic. Uh, and, uh, and that, in fact, uh, whereas people who are serious about anti-Jewish bigotry, uh, as I am, uh, and deeply invested in that project, um, uh, would want to try to distinguish between uh, foundational critics of Israel uh, who are driven to that uh, by anti-Jewish bigotry and foundational critics of Israel who are driven to that uh, by legitimate considerations uh, about which one might think one way or the other uh, about these complex issues in the Middle East. Uh, rather than doing that, uh, the goal on the part of uh, some of these organizations uh, has been to use uh, the, uh, the, the anti-Semitism issue uh, as a way of delegitimating uh, a whole part of the political spectrum on this question. Uh, and so uh, I, I constantly am besieged with emails uh, by scholars for peace in the Middle East, uh, about which more later if anybody wants to know, but uh, that this is a, an organization which is uh, dedicated to the defense uh, of uh, the, the current set of policies in Israel. Uh, and it uh, characterizes the movement for uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions uh, as itself uh, an anti-Semitic movement. Uh, and uh, this, it seems to me, uh, is a, a way of abusing uh, the, the, the category of hate speech um, and, uh, and seeking to impose in the name of civility uh, certain kinds of boundaries um, that, uh, that I think uh, you know, really is, uh, in some sense, uh, not only duplicitous, but deeply counterproductive. 
uh, that, that what it does is it has the effect uh, of putting people to the choice uh, between uh, their, their condemnation of particular uh, acts uh, by the Israeli state uh, and uh, uh, you know, this, uh, this, this question of anti-Semitism. Uh, and uh, and it, it indeed makes anti-Semitism appear a live option uh, for people because they've got no place else to go uh, faced with that choice. Um, that, I think, is a very dangerous thing that's being done. Uh, and, uh, and I think that what Salada was doing in these tweets, if you look at them in a broader context, uh, was to draw attention to that phenomenon uh, rather than actually seeking himself to legitimate anti-Semitism, and so there are other tweets, for example, uh, which uh, uh, you know, have uh, uh, quite the opposite view. He says, I refuse to conceptualize Israel-Palestine as Jewish-Arab acrimony. I am in solidarity with many Jews and in disagreement with many Arabs. Um, so um, uh, the, the, the idea that uh, this uh, invocation of civility can be used uh, as a basis of repression in this case is quite concerning. Um, on a similar note, the, uh, you might know that the chaplain uh, at, uh, at Yale, uh, Bruce Shipman, uh, was fired as Episcopal chaplain there uh, when he uh, submitted a letter to the New York Times that was published uh, in which he said to the editor, uh, Deborah E. Lipsat, uh, makes far too little of the relationship between Israel's policies in the West Bank and Gaza and growing anti-Semitism in Europe and beyond. Uh, the trend to which she alludes parallels the carnage in Gaza over the last five years, not to mention the perpetually stalled peace talks and continuing occupation of the West Bank. Uh, as hope for a two-state solution fades uh, and Palestinian casualties continue to mount, the best antidote to anti-Semitism would be for Israel's patrons abroad to press the government of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for foreign status, uh, a final status resolution to the Palestinian question. Um, again, not the way I would have expressed it, uh, but um, the, uh, the, the difficulty here again is uh, the, the you know, sort of storm of protest over what was seen as a kind of uncivil uh, way of, uh, of participating in that debate uh, when uh, the, the arguments being made uh, were really uh, far more nuanced and, and not, uh, I think, foundationally uh, something that could be characterized uh, in terms of hate speech. Uh, so uh, that set of issues uh, arises, uh, and, and so you know, civility has come up a, a great deal uh, in that context in recent times, but by no means uh, uh, solely there. Uh, there have been various kinds of, uh, of responses to invited speakers in various places, people who uh, were, were brought uh, to speak uh, uh, to uh, get honorary degrees at commencement uh, and were subjected to protests. And in uh, at least one case, there was the withdrawal uh, of an invitation to a speaker, Ayan Hirsi Ali, uh, who had uh, uh, was, was sort of uh, uh, associated uh, with certain controversial uh, expression. Um, we have uh, other kinds of, uh, of issues that have arisen coming from a different uh, uh, place on the political spectrum uh, where people have said things about veterans uh, that have uh, received a, a certain storm of comments uh, about uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, mischaracterizing uh, uh, people and, and, and you know, failing to have due regard for their contributions um, and, uh, and leading to uh, you know, various forms of castigation uh, of, uh, of authors and, uh, and, and, and Christopher Hayes, you might know, uh, had to give a rather humbling apology for raising the suggestion uh, on his television show uh, around the time of Veterans Day uh, that perhaps not all of our veterans uh, were indeed war heroes. Um, and so uh, you, you have a lot of discourse in the society uh, right now over the question of civility. Uh, and the question really is what criteria to bring to bear uh, to try to assess uh, these sorts of questions. And so uh, what I hope uh, to, to do here is to just you know, set, set forth a framework within which these issues can be analyzed and people can look at the, uh, particular issues in different ways. Um, but I, what I want to avoid are the kind of pat answers uh, that lead to the kind of condescension and exclusion uh, that I think has come from uh, many of the implications of, of civility uh, that we've seen recently. Thank you very much.
questions, comments? Um, I get your personal opinion on something. Um, the, the controversy right now with the change of the name of the Washington, D.C. football team, yeah. Redskins, mm -hmm. would you consider that an issue, um, I guess for those who are, I'm using your words here, invested in anti-Native bigotry, Native American bigotry, um, would you cons they would consider that use of the term Redskins as uh, an, an example of a continuing of social marginalization, subordination, and exclusion, just using your words. Whereas those who want to keep the name, okay, they don't see anything wrong with using the term. They feel there's nothing hateful about the term. Would you consider that just an example of being in civil? Um, or an intellectual error? My own personal sense of it is that the word is odious, um, mm -hmm. that it, we sh it should have been got rid of a long time ago, that mm -hmm. there's, there's really no way. I mean, the, the, the odd thing is it's been normalized, yeah. uh, and, and that's the problem. And so it mm -hmm. doesn't jump out at people anymore because they've been rooting for this team all this time, and they, you know, they haven't been rooting for it, they've been talking about it. Uh, and it just hasn't particularly occurred to people, and I think it's a good thing uh, to bring to people's attention that this is a really quite disgusting uh, term, that the, the equivalent of which we, we wouldn't accept in any, in any other context. Uh, the, there are some issues now whether the FCC might get into the act and try to prevent uh, uh, broadcast media from using the, uh, uh, the, the term redskin. I think that actually would lead to some significant First Amendment problems. Uh, but in, in other respects, I, I'm happy to see any pressure brought to bear on people uh, to, uh, to relinquish this term. Could I, could I follow yeah. up on that, Brad? Yeah. Because, because the trademark office essentially said they've lost their trademark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's, yeah. you know, I, I think you're trying to differentiate between state action mm -hmm. and our personal yeah. you know, program. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. there's already been some state yeah. action. Yeah. And I'm sure it'll be challenged. I, I don't know. Well, the, the FCC thing I've heard discussed more directly in, in person in terms of the trademark issue would be this is a very similar issue. So my, I had two remarks. One is I don't think your account of civility is correct. Um, I don't know if it represents your account at the end of your paper. You say civility acknowledges the person being addressed is making legitimate contributions to the conversation. It sounded like it was similar in the ballpark. You had another sentence similar to that. And I think there are, uh, it's more like what you alluded to, what people normally use that term to mean. I think it's closer to what you alluded to with the term, the duty of decorum. Because I can think of cases where people might think that the person's making a le legitimate contribution to the, to the conversation but they insult him because they think he's, I don't know, maybe he's defending pornography and they know that he's done something exploiting women and they really think that there's something to be said about having pornography permitted, not prohibited by the law. So he has something to say, contribute to the, con to the conversation, but they insult him and swear at him. And, and I would think that they're, most people would say, well, they're being uncivil. And vice versa, I think there are cases where you think, well, the person's not making a contribution, a, a legitimate contribution to the conversation, but we treat them with decorum, and I think that that would, most people would think that that would be treating them civilly, that they're, you're not, you know, you're respecting them, you're listening to what you say, you think actually it's full of baloney, but you want to hear it so you can refute it, and things like that. So that, that's, a, that's a conceptual point, and I don't know, maybe that's enough, and I'll come back to, to another about it. Give, I, I just grant you what you mean about, uh, you know, civility is roughly what you say in the sentence at the end, and I'm kind of milling about this, and I think it's really Rawlsian, it's uh, modus vivendi, it's, you know, we can't decide, it's better to let people say these things we really don't respect, and then we'll try to refute them, and, and people say that, and then we'll, we'll refute that, and, you know, it's better, it comes out better if you let everybody say their bit, and when they come to the campus, they defend Nazism and all kinds of crazy <coughs> stuff, and we just refute them. Well, first of all, in, in tactical terms, I think it might be entirely correct to say that letting people have their say mm -hmm. uh, is, is more effective 
uh, than, than trying to, uh, they're basically doing things that will allow them to play the victim. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm concerned, again, to make the argument for civility, not from the standpoint of saying it's important as a matter of principle, but because as a matter of strategy and tactics, yeah. this is what you want to do. And in fact, we've had here, one of the great moments I thought we had here, we had Daniel Pipes, uh, who came to speak, uh, who I don't know if you're familiar with generally, but uh, you know, has many uh, things to say about the, the Middle East uh, that uh, many of us find quite offensive. Um, and uh, there was a student group that attended there that, uh, you know, staged this silent walkout uh, in the midst of it. And everyone was, uh, you know, prior to that, uh, you know, perfectly respectful to him. And, uh, and I think it made a much deeper impression than would have been made uh, by, by acting out. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, actually my favorite moment of this sort of thing goes way back. In 1982, I was at a, an event uh, in uh, the federal courthouse in Philadelphia where uh, Arlen Specter, a senator from uh, Pennsylvania, had brought in a State Department official uh, to talk to community groups about uh, U.S. aid to El Salvador, which all of the groups that were present uh, vehemently opposed. Uh, and, and Specter uh, insisted on giving the State Department uh, person the floor. Uh, and uh, in response, uh, at the, in, the, in the front row were these uh, elderly Quaker women and they stood up and they turned their backs to the speaker. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. little by little throughout the entire hall, everybody had turned their back uh, to the State Department official who was just yeah. left there sort of babbling. Uh, and, uh, and eventually, Specter had to shut him down and move to the next part of the meeting. Uh, so that was the, 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 the best kind of demonstration that I had ever seen. Um, so I think you know, that that's true. Um, you know, with, with respect uh, to uh, the, the conversation participants, um, you know, there, there are, I think, these two problems of, of whether uh, the, what is being said is legitimate, uh, 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 is legitimate participation and uh, whether the person saying it is the appropriate person with whom to have that conversation. Uh, and there are moments in which, uh, you know, I'm willing to have a conversation about this, but not with you. Um, and and uh, one example I can give of that is on the torture controversy. Um, that uh, I was putting together a panel about torture, um, and, uh, and the question arose, should I invite John Yu, who was the, the sort of principal author of the so-called torture memos, um, and, uh, and my position uh, was that although I would be happy to invite someone who would articulate the same position, or maybe even a more arch position uh, on this, and there are academic defenders of those positions, uh, I would not be willing to have that conversation with John Yu because it would present to the public as though John Yu were an appropriate person to be having this conversation with expert to expert, uh, whereas the problem with John Yu was that he was a perpetrator. Uh, he was an unpunished wrongdoer. Uh, and we were dignifying him by setting him up. I'm perfectly happy to have a conversation with John Yu about his, his potential criminal liabilities. I'm willing to have a, a panel in which he would participate on that topic and defend himself. Uh, he wouldn't, I'm sure, agree to being on such a panel. Brad, do you, yeah. do you want to speak to the, my first point about conceptual yeah. one that I, yeah. I think you're defining, let's call it civility, Brad Braw's civility. <laughs> it's not what we normally mean, I'm claiming, sure. by civility. What we normally mean is something closer to what you're talking about, the duty of decorum. Mm -hmm. And so you're not criticizing, if that's what civility is, you're not criticizing civility, you're criticizing being always brittle. No, I, I don't <laughs> think that's right. Uh, I, I think that, the, that what we in fact talk about in, in terms of civility is more than decorum, mm -hmm. because what I'm characterizing as decorum is first of all a duty owed in a different direction. Mm -hmm. um, I don't owe a duty of decorum to the person uh, that I'm addressing, and, and indeed, I'm not sure that I owe it uh, to the audience as such. I, I felt that I owed it to my institution in that circumstance to, to, to carry myself in a particular way um, uh, for the sake of the institution's reputation. Don't you uh, owe it to me and me to you that you shouldn't insult me and it would be in de decorous if you did? Well, it would be also undecorous, but, but the question of whether it be uncivil is, is still a separate one. Uh, and, and being uncivil to you might actually be quite justifiable uh, if, if you were either the purveyor of these uh, you know, sort of inherently wrongful ideas, uh, like an Andrew McCarthy, or were an unpunished wrongdoer like a John Rizzo. Uh, I, I think that um, 
in, in Bruce's question is something that I, I, I came thinking about as, as a question, but let me preface that by saying that as I listen to you, um, I took a, a sense that what you're saying is profoundly un-American, in that you're, you're trying to <laughs> impose... Of that. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're trying to impose sort of intellectual standards and a careful weighing of evidence mm. sort of in a, in a society that, that doesn't want to think very much. <laughs> So I think what you you know what you said about the First Amendment is very good in a sense. It's like a faultless position, just let everything fly. Mm. But getting getting to Bruce's Bruce's point, what I came wanting to ask was about the forum. I mean, mm. you philosophers are, have got this way up in the air. But when you got the consequences, I said, I'm, I'm thinking that what you're talking about is incivility in a sense, inadmissible speech. Uh. Uh, in a, uh, you know, if it was a scientific meeting, there are certain people who are privileged to speak. Mm -hmm. if, you're in, if you're in a quantum physics debate, <laughs> you know, uh, folks just aren't going to, uh, uh, you know, unless you've done the work, you're, you're really not, you can't say anything. But you're talking about public speech that, and, and the notion of equality, everybody has a say, but it happens within certain contexts. Mm -hmm. So within a university debate, invited speakers. Now the forum has expanded to tweets, internet. Mm -hmm. I was, I, I put down here China slash Google, so it, mm -hmm. can, it can occupy a good chunk of the, of the world. And uh, it, it seems to me that, that you've got an idea that could be applied to, to these particular forums, but maybe uh, you'd have to look at it form by form uh, to determine how uh, this notion of an, of an inadmissible notion um, uh, has force and, and does not allow uh, a particular way in which expression occurs. I, I, I think that's, that's in there, yeah. but, but, but to work it out would probably require something as tedious as a law review article. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but I, I definitely think it, the context makes a great deal of difference, and 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 particularly too, you know, the the extent of, of sort of withholding or repudiating uh, the the sort of conferral of legitimacy that's created by the existence of a particular forum when someone is brought as an honored speaker or when someone is brought as a, uh, an honorary degree recipient, that's a different case than someone who just is, is holding some kind of event on campus and, and looking to uh, speak to some, you know, sponsored by some student group or whatever. Um, and, uh, and, and sometimes uh, the, the goal is to, to withdraw the invitation from below, as it were, um, you know, largely as a, a kind of expression uh, of uh, repudiation of, of this conferral of legitimacy that's taking place, and it might not apply uh, simply to the, the garden variety uh, campus speaker, uh, you know, brought uh, in a, you know, by an informal group. Yeah. It seems like intellectual thought can be such a knife because, on one hand, it sort of cuts its own hand, but at the same time, it tells, it deals with other categories of thought and sort of hits it. Um, so it seems like what you're arguing with, if, if I disagree with somebody, and I say, oh, I shouldn't let them speak because I disagree with them, well then, if somebody disagrees with me, wouldn't they want to have the same conundrum to say to me, oh, I disagree with him, so therefore he shouldn't speak. Right. So I, I, it seems like it's, it's sort of like it's, it's a paradox in what you're saying. Well, let some people speak because they're giving, they, they have morally acceptable views, and we other people who don't have morally acceptable views, we can't let them speak, or we're incivil to them. I, am I understanding you correctly? Yeah, you're understanding me correctly, but, <laughs> but, but except that what the point is that, that it's not simply a matter of imposing my preference, uh, because the principle that I'm articulating is not uh, you know, justified by the fact that I happen to articulate it. It's justified by the fact that it has mm -hmm. a, a, a kind of moral significance which is not beneath the moral significance of the principle of free speech, uh, but actually goes to the, the, the underlying principles that give us the principle of free speech in the first place. That is the principle of equal concern and respect. So, so let me understand this correctly. So if someone is saying something offensive, 
that I would find it offensive and uh, it would be in a public forum. And then it would be my duty to not allow that person to speak. Well, it, it would be my moral duty to shut them down. Not necessarily, but if, again, it's not because you disagree with them. It's not because you are subjectively offended by them. And my point about hate speech is that hate speech isn't wrong because it's offensive. It's offensive because it's wrong. Uh, and that there is something at least as objective about the wrongfulness of speech as there is uh, something objective about the principle of freedom of expression itself. Uh, that, that the procedural, we, the, 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 the tendency, uh, for the, the way we kind of been socialized in the United States to think about these things is that there is something objective about the procedural value uh, of freedom of expression and something subjective about the substantive value uh, that, that attaches to, to you know, what's being debated. Uh, and I want to argue that that is, is not correct. Uh, that that uh, the, the, the reason why we embrace particular procedural values uh, is because we uh, expect that those processes uh, will work out in a particular way to further certain substantive values. And what happens when they don't? Um, uh, you know, we have to we have to sort of grapple with that question. Um, but again, you know, my, my claim is not that people uh, necessarily ought to disrupt someone's speech. Uh, indeed, probably tactically, most of the time, that's not a great idea uh, if what you're trying to do is, is to cause people to see uh, that, that this, uh, this speech is uh, uh, inappropriate. In fact, uh, what you should advise people to do if they're, if they're if sort of confronted with that kind of speech mm -hmm. is to come up with some more creative way uh, to uh, uh, to sort of present the issue uh, to people so that they might properly hear it rather than allowing the speaker to come off as a victim. Could I link this to something yeah. you said at the yeah. beginning? I, I was thinking that your notion of incivility would depend on the forum, mm -hmm. going from you know Google to mm -hmm. a classroom, let's say. But you said at the beginning that uh, the, uh, the virtue of civility, uh, of, of, of decorum, uh, might be owed towards a person, but you were saying that um, uh, civility or incivility is is um, a beauty that's owed towards others, and you and you mentioned victims in the context is hate speech. Might it be that your concept of incivil incivility applies differently when the subject is hate speech as opposed to other kinds of speeches? Because with hate speech, we're dealing with it. Yeah, I don't know if, uh, if uh, uh, Socrates was thinking about, but groups who could be right. physically and other and harmed in other ways. Right. Well, yeah. What I'm saying is that you know we have to take into account the, the balance between our duties to the people upon whom we're acting and the per, the, the, the duties uh, up to to people upon whose behalf we undertake to act. Uh, and those might be the latter might be people whose uh, lives are affected in a negative way by the normalization of that kind of discourse. Uh, and so uh, you know, withdrawing or repudiating uh, expressions of the acknowledgments of the legitimacy of that speech are important. If, if what we're going to say is that, that, that you know, people who are questioning your equal status in the society uh, are, are you know, to be uh, accorded the, the same level of respect as any other uh, uh, participant in a conversation, uh, where uh, a fact, in fact, you know, committing a wrong uh, against that group uh, whose, whose status is being called into question. Uh, we are, we're making it an open question uh, when it oughtn't to be an open question as to whether we accord equal concern or respect. There's another cross there. I'm just saying, um, truth is an innocence uh, sort of subjective in itself. Uh, uh, because like I said, it's going back to morality and, and it's going against good and bad and it's going back to the doctrines of what people believe to be true. So to do that would have to really start to be finite and starting to try to define people. I mean, because that seems like the most impossible. I see where you're saying neutrality comes, you know, looking at things from a broad scale and putting all the things in perspective. But at the same time, just by trying to send that, like, for instance, the red skin thing, um, it's, it's, it's making these, these subjects more sensitive. And it's, I think it could be the opposite effect with their generation by not handling certain truths and trying to cover them up in a sense, not totally, because you don't want the ignorance to rule, but at the same time, it's like, it's, it just seems sort of hard to make truth be as objective 
or neutral as possible? Well, yeah, the neutral wouldn't be a term that I would use in respect of this, but I, I think that, uh, you know, of course there, is, there are certain kinds of uncertainties that beset all of our commitments. Uh, there's also frequently no safe side on which to err. Uh, and so uh, we, we have to, uh, at, at some point, invest ourselves uh, in a particular conception uh, of, of you know, what the, the proper standards are of political morality. Uh, and we do that uh, on one side when we embrace uh, this, this uh, particular notion of, of freedom of expression anyway. Uh, so it's, it's not as though uh, we're, we're talking about uh, a, a kind of uh, a choice between being uh, uh, you know, skeptical about our ability to reach the truth or not, uh, because we, we, we have, we're going to be governed by one or another principle uh, regardless of how we uh, deal with this. And at some point, we simply have to uh, take whatever position uh, that uh, it makes sense to us to take uh, on these questions. And, you know, we, what is it ultimately that equal concern and respect requires of us as a principle? Um, and that's, that's what I'm speaking to. What? I'm curious. In Brad Ross world, who decides <laughs> What hate speech is wrong? Is it Brad Raw? Is it society? Is it the law? Who makes that decision? Well, that you know, I think that on the one hand, you know, if you were to if you were to create if, if you were to have the kind of norm that you had in Article 20 of the ICCPR, uh, then you would have to actually have some sort of body, uh, typically a court, uh, come to the determination of what counts uh, as hate speech or what counts as violating the principle. Uh, and that, of course, would create all of the problems that I mentioned about the, the difficulty of uh, the, the trustworthiness of the implementer. Um, in terms of our own you know, dealings with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, ultimately, you know, we're sort of our own court of appeal. I mean, we, we, we have to come to our own conclusion about what our duty is in respect of what's going on. Uh, and, and as I say, there's no safe side on which to err. The, the, the argument for humility doesn't really get you anywhere here because it's, it's true that I might be wrong about whatever, but I could be wrong in either direction. Uh, and, uh, and it can be uh, also wrong uh, to uh, uh, you know, sort of tacitly affirm uh, the legitimacy of, of, uh, of viewpoints of individuals uh, who are uh, deeply a threat to, to parts of the society. So there isn't any pope, and thank God it isn't wrong. <laughs> <laughs>